tonight. Diplomatic summit. Foreign ministers of major nations ready to meet in Russia. China confirms its foreign minister Wang Yi's attendance. Experts reveal. Experts verify the use of US-made bombs in Israeli airstrikes on the UN-run school in central Gaza. Comparing conflicts. Biden warns democracies across the globe is once again under threat, adding autocrats were closely watching the Western response to Ukraine. And 50 days left. Olympic rings on the Eiffel Tower with 50 days to go until the Summer Olympics in the French capital. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for tuning in tonight on World News. We have lots of fresh updates to bring to you tonight and we begin with some regional affairs over in China. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Mao Ning said today that Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi will be attending a BRICS Foreign Ministers meeting in Russia from the 10th of June 2024. The Chinese spokesperson said that Wang Yi is also a member of the political bureau of the Communist Party of China Central Committee and he will exchange views with the foreign ministers of the other BRICS countries and invited foreign ministers from guest countries on issues related to the BRICS cooperation and the current international and regional situation and prepare for the 16th meeting of the BRICS leaders. In a historic milestone, BRICS expanded its membership and welcomed six countries in August last year during the 15th BRICS summit in South Africa's Johannesburg. Noting this is the first meeting of the foreign ministers since the expansion of the organization's membership, Mao said that China is willing to work with its partners to consolidate the BRICS strategic partnership, deepen practical cooperation in various fields and enhance common development of the global south and achieve a good start for the greater BRICS cooperation. More in China now, the Chinese Foreign Ministry said today that Beijing will be allowing the Philippines to send vital supplies to a warship grounded at a disputed shoal in the South China Sea if it gives an advance notice. The comment was in response to the Philippine Coast Guard's accusation that its Chinese counterpart blocked efforts to evacuate a sick member of its armed forces in the South China Sea, calling its actions barbaric and inhumane. The incident, which Philippines said took place last month, involved a member of small contingent of marine posted to guard the BRPS Sierra Madre, a Philippine vessel grounded at disputed Second Thomas Shoal, which China refers to as the Rinai Reef. The Philippines and China have sparred repeatedly this past year near disputed features that fall in Manila's exclusive economic zone. China routinely accuses the Philippines of encroachment, while Manila and its allies have condemned what they call aggression by Beijing. And now some updates from the Israel-Palestine conflict. Following Israel's airstrike on a UN-run school in central Gaza yesterday, a report has cited experts who verified the use of US-made bombs. Meanwhile, Hamas says no ceasefire proposal will be signed without a permanent ceasefire. Weapons experts analyzing footage of the Israeli airstrike on a Gaza school, where around 40 people lost their lives in the early hours of Thursday morning, suggest that Israel likely used US-made bombs. According to a Washington Post report on the same day, five experts who examined footage taken following the attack verified that the nose cone of a GBU-39, small diameter bomb, was manufactured by Boeing. Local officials in Gaza said that Israel had hit the Al-Sardi school operated by the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Nusrayid refugee camp. The school was reportedly sheltering displaced people with local officials saying that at least 37 people were killed, including women and children. Israeli forces are saying that the attack was precisely conducted to target at least 30 Hamas militants inside the school. We conducted the strike once our intelligence and surveillance indicated that there were no women or children inside the Hamas compound, inside those classrooms. While the Israeli government says it will release more information about the strike, including the names of the victims, the U.S. said it expects Israel to be fully transparent in sharing the information publicly. Meanwhile, according to a Wall Street Journal report, Hamas's leader in Gaza, Yahya Sinwar, told Arab mediators on Thursday that Hamas is not going to surrender without a permanent ceasefire. This is Hamas's first response to an apparent Israeli three-phase ceasefire proposal outlined by U.S. President Joe Biden at the end of last month. On Thursday, the leaders of 17 countries, including the United States, issued a joint statement backing the proposal, which includes the release of the hostages.
And in the Russia-Ukraine war now, U.S. President Joe Biden has drawn parallels between Russia's invasion of Ukraine and World War II in a speech commemorating the 80th anniversary of the D-Day landings in Normandy, France. Mr. Biden warned democracies across the globe were once again under threat, adding autocrats were closely watching the Western response to Ukraine. For more insights on this story, let's connect with other than a world news special correspondent, Minoli Zagaria, joining us from Kursk in Russia. What do you have for us, Minoli? A host of world leaders were present at ceremonies yesterday, including French President Emmanuel Macron, King Charles III and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Mr. Macron said, as the gathered world leaders gave Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky a standing ovation, that they thank the Ukrainian people for their bravery and they are here and they will not weaken. Russian President Vladimir Putin, who was not invited to yesterday's commemoration ceremony, launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Throughout the speech, Mr. Biden frequently drew connections between the fight against fascism in World War II and the ongoing war in Ukraine. He vowed the U.S. would not walk away from the conflict, claiming if they do, Ukraine will be subjugated and it will not end there and Ukraine's neighbor will be threatened, all of Europe will be threatened. And he launched a direct attack on President Putin, referring the long-term Russian leader as a tyrant. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Menoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. And marking the closure of the Olympics Paris 2024, organizers unveiled today a display of the Olympic rings on the Eiffel Tower, with just 50 days to go until the Summer Olympics in the French capital. The construction, measuring 29 by 13 meters and made by recycled steel, was installed at night on the south side of the Paris iconic Eiffel Tower. The impressive feat involved around 30 workers and the use of four arc cranes. The Eiffel Tower will be prominently featured during the Paris Olympics, serving as the venue for beach volleyball competitions held at its base. Additionally, the opening ceremony will take place on the Seine River, which flows past the Eiffel Tower's feet. In a nod to history, pieces of steel taken from the Eiffel Tower have been incorporated into Paris 2024 Olympic medals. The Paris Olympics are scheduled to occur from the 26th of July to the 11th of August. The largest union at South Korean tech giant Samsung Electronics began a walkout today and the union delivered guidelines to all of its 28,000 members regarding taking collective leave, stating that it's only the first step of plans for a general strike. The largest union at South Korean tech giant Samsung Electronics began a walkout on Friday. The union delivered guidelines to all of its 28,000 members regarding taking collective leave. Uh, market research firm TrendForce said, though, the one-day walkout wouldn't affect Samsung's manufacturing process, pointing to Samsung's high dependence on automation. It also said that because Thursday was a holiday, many employees had originally planned to take a day off. A union official said that the collective leave is the only first step of plans for a general strike. It is unknown how many employees are taking part in Friday's walkout. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. And on the road to the White House tonight, five months out from the presidential election, the state of the youth vote in some ways remain a question mark. It's a regularly covered topic as President Biden continues to receive low marks from Gen Z and millennial voters, even as the same age group decidedly voted for him just four years ago. Among younger black, Latin and Asian American voters who overwhelmingly sided with Biden in 2020 and at higher rates than young white voters did, support has considerably faltered, according to the University of Chicago's latest Gen Forward survey. The survey, exclusively obtained by NPR, which was conducted from May 10 to 22, pulled the political attitudes of 2089 Americans under 40, with largely equal samples of white, black, Latino and Asian American and Pacific Islander individuals. It found that just one-third of all young Americans said they would back Biden if the election was held at the time of the survey conducted. The poll also reflects a virtual tie in the race. Biden leads former President Donald Trump by two points and 34% of respondents are currently backing a third-party candidate or said they would support someone else. Despite speculation over how U.S. support for Israel army may negatively affect Biden's youth coalition, the poll found that war in Gaza is not the top voting issue for most young Americans. 
Instead, economic concerns, particularly over inflation, remain front and center. A federal judge has said that Steve Bannon, a former top advisor to Donald Trump, must report to prison by the 1st of July to serve a four-month sentence for contempt of Congress. A federal judge on Thursday ordered Steve Bannon, a former top advisor to Donald Trump, to report to prison by July 1st to serve a four-month sentence for contempt of Congress. The decision means the right-wing media firebrand will likely be behind bars for a critical stretch of the U.S. presidential campaign as Republican candidate Trump faces Democratic President Joe Biden in November. This is about shutting down the MAGA movement. Bannon spoke outside the courthouse after the judge's ruling, saying he would ask the U.S. Supreme Court to intervene. There's not a prison built or a jail built that will ever shut me up. All victory to MAGA, we're going to win this, we're going to win at the Supreme Court, and more importantly, we're going to win on November 5th. The order by the judge in Washington came after a federal appeals court last month rejected Bannon's bid to overturn his conviction for spurning a subpoena from a congressional panel that investigated the January 6, 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol. Bannon will be the second former top official from Trump's White House to go to prison for refusing to cooperate with the committee. Peter Navarro, a former trade advisor, is currently serving a four-month term. Hunter Biden's ex-girlfriend, Halle Biden, who is also the widow of his brother, Beau, delivered emotional testimony just yesterday in Biden's federal gun trial. She talked about how she discovered the weapon in his truck in October of 2018 and then panicked and threw it away because she didn't want him to hurt himself or the kids to find it and hurt themselves. A star witness in a potentially pivotal piece of video evidence at the trial of President Biden's son, Hunter, Hallie Biden, the widow of Hunter's brother, Bo, testified this surveillance video shows her throwing away her brother-in-law's gun in a Delaware grocery store parking lot on October 23rd, 2018. Just 11 days after Hunter Biden bought the gun and just after Hallie Biden said she found it in Hunter Biden's car along with drug residue and drug paraphernalia. Hallie testified, I didn't want him to hurt himself or the kids to find it and hurt themselves. I was panicking. Prosecutors are trying to prove Hunter Biden was addicted or using drugs at the time he bought the gun, lying on this federal gun application. Hallie Biden also described taking up a romantic relationship with her brother-in-law about a year after her late husband, Beau Biden's 2015 death, telling the jury it was also Hunter Biden who introduced her to using crack cocaine, calling her drug use a terrible experience. I'm embarrassed and ashamed. Prosecutors showed Hallie Biden the gun and images of the satchel in which she found and discarded it. But Hunter Biden's attorney, Abby Lowell, tried to show Hallie Biden didn't actually know what Hunter was doing the week he bought the gun. You don't know if he was drinking, using, or either of the above, Lowell asked. I don't know, she responded. Homelessness is on the rise across major Argentine cities as the new libertarian government's tough medicine reforms squeeze pensions, state salaries and push up rental prices, forcing more people into poverty. In this little kitchen in Buenos Aires, staff from the Amigos en el Camino charity prepare food and packets of personal hygiene supplies for delivery to the homeless and hungry around the city. Organizer Monica de Rusis, who has helped run Amigos en el Camino for the past 13 years, told she's seeing two changes. First, a sharp rise in the number of homeless. And second, a surge in people who aren't homeless, but are still in need of a meal. Homelessness is on the rise across major Argentine cities as the new libertarian government enacts what it sees as tough medicine reforms. This means fiscal cuts that are squeezing pensions and pushing up rental prices, forcing more people into poverty. The latest survey by local authorities showed the official number of Argentines sleeping on the streets of Buenos Aires reached 4,009 in April, up from 3,511 a year prior. These numbers are being replicated in other urban centers like Córdoba and Rosario as President Javier Millet rebalances the state purse at a deep cost to the economy and the most vulnerable. Coupled with near 300 percent annual inflation, the choice for many Argentines this southern hemisphere winter is between heating and eating. A report from the Catholic University of Argentina showed nearly 18 percent of households could no longer meet their basic food and energy needs in the first quarter of this year. 
A high level of poverty is nothing new for Argentina. The South American country has registered a poverty rate firmly above 25 percent in the past two decades. But the recent increase is significant. Estimates suggest that roughly 25 million people lived in poverty during the first three months of 2024, up 10 percent compared to the same period last year. South Africa's African National Congress leader Cyril Ramaphosa said that they will invite other political parties to form a government of national unity after a meeting of the ANC's National Executive Committee. South Africa's African National Congress is leaning towards trying to form a government of national unity with a wide range of parties, it said on Wednesday. That's after the ANC lost its majority. For the first time since Nelson Mandela led it to power in 1994 elections that marked the end of apartheid. It remains the largest party, but is unable to govern alone. Spokesperson Mahlengi Bengu Motsiri cited the results of last week's election, saying a government of national unity is what the people of South Africa said to us. Bengu Motsiri said the ANC has been talking to five parties, ranging from the Free Marketeer Democratic Alliance to the Marxist Economic Freedom Fighters. The business sector and investors have a strong preference for a deal with the strongly pro-business DA. Thank you. The EFF's policies, including nationalising mines and banks and redistributing land from white to black farmers, are viewed less positively by markets and the private sector. The RAND currency extended losses in volatile trade as Bengu Mutsiri spoke, trading down more than 1% against the dollar at one stage. <laughs> the ANC will have 159 seats in the 400-seat National Assembly, the DA 87 and the EFF 39. A new entrant, Umkonto Sizwe or MK, came a surprisingly strong third in the May 29th vote and will have 58 seats. However, it is led by former scandal hit president Jacob Zuma, who is an enemy of President Cyril Ramaphosa. Bengu Motsiri said the ANC had approached MK but had been rebuffed. Let's take a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Before we wrap up, here are some updates on the ongoing T20 World Cup matches. We saw a shocking loss by Pakistan against the US team yesterday as the games pick up the pace. And we await the results of a hearty face-off as Canada faces Ireland. In the USA vs Pakistan match, the United States team made history beating Pakistan as Saurabh Netravakar's heroics in the Super Bowl helped the United States beat Pakistan by five runs in the end. Monarch Patel's composed half-century and cameo from Aaron Jones helped the USA to level the score from 159 with the loss of three wickets in the chase for a Super Bowl. Earlier knocks by Babar Azam, Shadab Khan and Shaheen Shafridi took Pakistan 159 for the loss of seven wickets in the first innings against the United States. In the match between Namibia and Scotland this morning, knocks by Richie Barrington and Michael Lesk helped Scotland defeat Namibia by five wickets in their Tweet World Cup 2024 Group B match. Opting to bat, Namibia posted 155 runs for the loss of nine wickets in the end of the 20 overs, with skipper Grihard Erasmus scoring 52. For Scotland, Brad Wheel scalped three wickets and later Scotland chased down the target in 18 overs and three balls, with Barrington and Les scoring 47 not out and 35 runs respectively. The encounter between Ireland and Canada kicked off a while ago at Nassau County International Cricket Stadium in New York. Ireland won the toss and chose to bowl first, inviting Canada to initiate the batting. Both teams lost their first matches in the group stage games, with Canada being defeated by the United States and Ireland facing a loss against India. And that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again on Monday for more key updates from across the globe. Stay tuned as Sina Mayadune will soon join you in just a moment with a nightly business report. Thank you for watching. Good night.